when I would come home from school, it was like I would watch it unsupervised and feel like I was glimpsing something naughty. You know what I mean? <laughs> so, so the movie made a real impression on me, and I loved it. I also loved that it was a movie about funny people being funny. As a lover of comedy, like it, 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 it was a movie that that was sort of filled unabashedly with jokes. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, the notion of remaking it was completely daunting. I mean, I was in the midst of season one of Modern Family when the script came across my desk, and I was like, why would you do this? Why Why would you want to remake Arthur? My first reaction was that that's kind of crazy. And mm-hmm. then I heard that Russell Brand was attached to play Arthur, and I thought, well... If there's one actor sort of on the planet that reinvents the role for a new generation of moviegoers that, you know, he's the guy. When I think of Russell Brand, I think about kind of the unconstrained stream of consciousness kind of yeah. I- improvisation. So you as a director, how do you facilitate that? Well, I'm glad you used the word facilitate, actually, because that really is my job. You know, a lot of people ask me the question, how do you rein in Russell Brand? <laughs> and 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 I I usually answer you know if I was trying to rein him in I would be a really bad director you know mm-hmm. what he does is sort of brilliant the way his mind works is absolutely incredible his access to and use of vocabulary is virtually Shakespearean yeah. and you know if you're a fan of his or not you've got to admire that you know it's it's incredible the guy's really smart so. Yes, my job was to facilitate that that improvisational ability and channel it specifically into the kind of character we wanted to create for this version of Arthur, which mm-hmm. is, a, you know, a guy who is, frankly, sweeter and more innocent than any of the characters he's played before. You know, I, I recall when the original Arthur came out and, and then they were trying to get the sequel going, uh, and, and it was around the time that addiction had, had become front page news, and there were more and more treatment centers, and it, it was seen as more of an epidemic. Yeah. And, and so there was some sensitivity. Is it responsible to make a comedy about a, an alcoholic? Yeah. Uh, did, what? How did you approach that aspect of the script? Well, um, to a certain extent, our screenwriter Peter Bainham, who, who's brilliant, you know, he's he's won all sorts of awards in England. He created Alan Partridge and, um, you know, wrote for Sasha Baron Cohen, Borat and Bruno. Mm -hmm. um, You know, to some extent, Peter addressed that for us. In the original draft of the script I read, that scene that appears in the movie where Arthur sort of reluctantly gives in and goes to AA existed. And... I, you know, you know, people who hear that might cringe. It's like, oh no, Arthur goes to AA. That's terrible. But Peter had such a unique take on the scene, and something so sort of unlikely happens in that AA scene, mm. and um, it's it's darkly funny in just the right kind of way that he was able to both address the issue and undercut it. And I thought, well, uh, you know, this is the right writer for this project. It's the right mm-hmm. way to approach it. And, you know, we started with that and continued to sort of answer that question of, of, of how do you sort of um, retain the irreverence of the original movie, but at the same time, you know, um, make audiences embrace a guy who's who's essentially a drunk, that, that, that they're going to they're going to have a natural desire to want to see him change. And was Hobson, in, in his script, was it written as a woman from the, from the get-go? It was. You know, my, that was my second reservation beyond, beyond who's going to play Arthur. It was, well, how do you get out, out from under the shadow of John Gilgood's incredible performance in the original? Mm-hmm. Like, he, he, that performance is incredible. And, and so... You know, the notion of making Hobson a nanny instead of a butler seems like a pretty (laughs) (laughs) delicious comedic idea, you know what I mean? Not just because it's funny that a 35-year-old man still has his nanny from childhood taking care of him and essentially functioning as his day-to-day best friend. 
Um, but also because the idea of Helen Mirren nannying Russell Brand was automatically funny and a, a different relationship than than the core relationship between Hobson and Arthur in the original movie. Different enough that I felt like, well, there's the kernel of something original inside of what uh, is otherwise a remake. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and she's phenomenal. I mean, she has that that regal kind of presence, but it's also obvious that she definitely has a sense of humor about herself. Yeah, definitely. I mean, that's the thing. People don't know this about Helen Mirren. I, she, she's wickedly funny. You know, she really <laughs> is. It's like they know her as this incredible dramatic actress, but she's got an unbelievable sense of humor and a real irreverent streak. In fact, if, you, if, if you're, you know, lucky enough to interview either of them, it's Helen that's more likely to say the controversial thing than Russell. <laughs> Russell will say some body things and be absolutely entertaining and hilarious, but it's Helen that'll throw down. What What really excites me about the film is the the immaculate cast um and with the original film it's such a strong powerful story i mean it's it's sturdy and there's a sweetness there and all the characters are well defined but i i i would imagine the one that took a little more work would have been susan in terms <laughs> of making her more her motivations more kind of palatable and understandable to the audience you, you bring up an excellent point that was one of our biggest challenges in, de- in developing the script and updating the story. But Susan, in the original Arthur, is played by Jill Eikenberry as basically a wimp. This woman who is inexplicably, hopelessly in love with Arthur and wants desperately to marry him in spite of the fact that he is a mess. <laughs> if you took that character and transposed it into a modern movie the audience would say, what? I don't buy that for a minute. Like, who is this woman? That's not, uh, that has no correlation for, to reality. It barely stood up to 1981 movie logic. Barely. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You know? So, so we had to sort of reinvent Susan and um, rethink her motivations. And in a weird way, Susan Johnson took the role of Burt Johnson in our story. Mm. She becomes the villain. She becomes the bully. And the she's, the, she's of, the aggressor. She's and, the aggressor, exactly. And, and, and Jennifer Garner did a great job not only playing against type, although it's not entirely playing against type for Jennifer because in the past she's, she's always played very smart and strong. It's just mm-hmm. she's mixed in sweet. So you in this ca- in this character she plays smart and strong and you mix in a little villainous and a little bit crazy <laughs> and you've got something new and fun frankly I mean I I I adore Jennifer and I'm so grateful to her for sinking her teeth into this role I mean like when else have you seen her you know in a in a bustier playing naughty kitty you know mm. <laughs> uh, it's kind of it's kind of delightful Something I've always wanted to see, and you, you absolutely, me too. I'm I'm first in line to see that too. Uh, but you mentioned Burt Johnson, and, and yeah. this is the casting that excites me the most is Nick Nolte, yeah. Because I th- I think intimidating, uh, yeah. As the original character was, and I think totally. oh man, it, who, who more intimidating than, than Nick Nolte as well? A, that's another like father-in-law. Scene. Yeah, exactly. Nick Nolte as the as the intimidating father-in-law. I mean, that's another scene that you don't realize it. But the original Arthur defined the intimidating father-in-law as a movie cliché. Mm. You know, like, like I don't think you know, um, Robert De Niro's character in Meet the Parents would exist without that, that scene in the original Arthur where, mm-hmm. where uh, you know, he, he, he shows him the, the moose head and his, his gun collection, <laughs> you know? So, so it was actually a really difficult scene to re- reconceive because every notion of it felt like it had been done. You know what I mean? We had to right. find kind of a new way that no one had seen before for the father-in-law to intimidate the, the, the potential suitor who does or does not, in this case, want to marry his daughter. And Nick Nolte, obviously, Nick Nolte is such a fun choice for it for me because <laughs> because... He's unpredictable. I mean, Nick is is this 
fantastic combination of method actor with, you know, a little bit crazy. And mm. I say that in a really loving and awesome way. And I, you know, the, the, the idea of putting him and Russell Brand in a scene together is kind of combustible. I could imagine so, yeah. yeah. Uh, that's why we love him because that's he, why he we gets love a little crazy. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, when you're doing comedy, which you've you've you came from comedy, yeah. I- I- improvisational comedy, didn't you? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I studied uh, I studied with Del Close in Chicago, um, who is sort of the uh, guru of comedy and improvisation. He taught uh, Belushi, Radner, hmm. uh, Murray, uh, Farley. Oh. He was the guy who was credited seriously, as the metaphysical consultant on the first two seasons of Saturday Night Live, which I believe meant he provided the drugs. Um, <laughs> which uh, was but, as important as anything else. Exactly. Yeah. Um, at least at that time. Um, so, uh, But he has since uh, passed away, and I was lucky enough um, to, to study with him at the Improv Olympic Theater in Chicago before I moved to Los Angeles. And, and so much of what I learned from him, um, I, I felt like I, I put to use in, in directing this movie. Um, he wrote a book called Truth and Comedy, which is uh, kind of brilliant and, and, and formed. It, it was definitely an influence on me. To me, it, he was always less concerned with, with the joke than the truth of the moment. Right. He, he always believed that the funny would come if, if the moment was real. Performing in front of an audience, performing comedy in front of a live audience is a bit yeah. different than on film or television where you don't have that necessarily that immediate response. So when you're in the midst of shooting and you're, you're looking back through the rushes and you've reviewed it you know, dozens and dozens of times and you kind of lose your perspective on it, how do you, how do you know if it's working? It's interesting. I mean, your your instincts about what's working and what's not get honed when you're shooting television, which you have to do so much more quickly than than when you're shooting a movie. You know yeah. that that doing season one of Modern Family was um, an education for me in diagnosing what's working and what's not about a scene. Steve Levitan and Chris Lloyd, who are the executive producers and creators of that show. Um, are so good at it. They 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 they're they're like they're like comedy physicians, and I I feel like I learned so much from them um, in terms of how to identify what's working or what's not about a scene. Um, but the other tool you have at your disposal, at least in the case of Arthur, is brilliant improvisational acting. You know, you have Russell who thinks like a writer, so. So if a joke's not working, he's got another one just loaded up in the barrel. And even if the joke is working, he's got three more loaded up in the barrel. So, so you know, it, it, I think the DVD of this movie is going to be a lot of fun for people to see as you see how much material we had to call.